Have you ever wondered how to start a fund and just had no idea how to do it? There are funds that do all kinds of things, even bringing in companies that they would invest in. And aren't there some funds that are blind? The investor doesn't really know what the property is yet. And aren't there some funds where they already know what they're going to be acquiring? So I just thought, oh my gosh, this sounds way too broad. And you don't have the experience as the fund manager. Well, today we are going to tell you exactly how you can start a fund. I'm Kathy Fetke. I'm co-host of Bigger Pockets on the Market, presented by Fundrise. I'm here with syndication attorney Mauricio Raud, who's very well known in our industry for helping so many investors set up their funds and set it up legally. <laughs> uh, so let's start there. Welcome, first of all. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here and giving us some free legal advice. And yeah. Everybody gets excited <laughs> in the legal, uh, free legal advice. Absolutely. Uh, uh, all right. So what is a fund and how does it differ from a syndication or is it different? It is it is different. So the main difference between a fund and a, what we call a project-specific syndication is just the order in which you do things. So in a project-specific syndication, you would first identify the property, get in the contract, and then go raise the money for that particular property and that particular business plan. So you know exactly how much you need to raise, maybe it's a million dollars or whatever it is, right? With a fund, it's the other way around. You first raise the money first, and then you go out looking for the properties. And so you don't actually show the investors a particular property. You show investors sort of like criteria or parameters or fund criteria that you're thinking about going to execute on your plan. But aren't there some funds that are blind? Like you said, the investor doesn't really know what the property is yet, but, they're, but they have an idea of what it will be. And aren't there some funds where they already know what they're going to be acquiring? Yes, there's a lot of ways you can structure these, right? So you can have a fund that you purchasing multiple properties you've already identified. And then there's sort of a hybrid model where you've identified a couple of the properties, but then you're going to continue to acquire more and more as you go forward. So when I talk about a fund, I really am talking about a blind fund, which means I don't know exactly what properties I'm going to buy. And then a project specific fund or syndication, I know exactly what I'm going to buy. And then there are some things that go in between where sometimes you, like I said, you identify one of the properties. And then when you close on that, you continue to raise money on the blind side. So it's it's somewhere along that spectrum. So we just started a single family rental fund and we had a buy box, right? So we know we want 30% equity in it, or you know, we want to buy at this price point under $200,000 in this particular area of North Texas. It was very specific uh, how much renovation we would be doing, what kind of neighborhood. So it's not so hard to find that in the area that we're targeting. Uh, there's a, a lot of it, especially today. So investors are surprised by what we're buying. But how could that be different, say, it would be just my opinion on multifamily, or some other asset class where it seems like it can differ more. Yeah, most of the funds that we work with, which are either multifamily or self-storage or mobile home parks, they tend to be a little bit vaguer on the description. That was a very, very specific outline of what you're looking for. Generally, clients that I work with, they, they try and be somewhat specific because the investors need to know and be comfortable with, with that fund criteria. But from their perspective, they want to also want to have as much flexibility as they, as they can. So they want to get some parameters, but they don't want to get so detailed that they're sort of they're constrained. And if they find a property that they want to get, it may be outside of that fund criteria. So I tend to see more broader fund criteria and parameters that they're putting into their documentation. Okay. So let's talk about that from the investor perspective. How can a, an investor protect themselves in a blind fund? In the case where we're extremely specific about where we're buying and what we're buying and how much rehab and what kind of discount and so forth, who's managing it. We already have the property management in place. We vetted it. An investor in a totally blind fund can't really vet anything, right? That's one of the biggest differences and why it's often much harder to raise money for a blind fund because in a regular syndication, like you mentioned, an investor can look at the property, can look at the pretty pictures, can look at the market you chose, can look at your business plan, and more importantly, they can look at your assumptions, your pro forma, right? So they may look at your performance and say, wait a minute, you're, you're expecting a 10% rent increase this year, and I don't think that's possible. I think that's too much. I'm going to assume five. They can challenge your assumptions. Yeah. With a blind fund, they can't. Yeah. And so in a blind fund, there really are betting on the force, right? They're betting on the sponsor. So it's super important as a past investor to make sure you do your due diligence on the sponsor. You should do that anyway, obviously in the project specific, but in a blind fund, that becomes even more important. But what is a sponsor's track record, for example? What's their experience? Do they have a team? 
Uh, do they have processes? Uh, are they an expert in that particular asset class? Because you might be the world's greatest multifamily investor, but this fund happens to be Vummel Home Parts, right? So do they have somebody on their team that has that particular asset class? Or maybe the market, right? Maybe you are really great in the Florida and Texas market, but this now you're going to go into the Alaska market. So how, how well do you know to the Alaska market? So it's all of that due diligence. It's even more important in a fund than a project specific because that's really, even though you're a past investor, the work goes in on the front end because once you write that check, you, you really have no control at that point. That's why you're passing. And I've seen a few of those come across my desk where people wanted to be very broad in their fund, even bringing in companies that they would invest in and tech stocks. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this sounds way too broad. And you don't have the experience as the fund manager. But there are funds that do all kinds of things. Yes, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of that either because, yeah. you know, from a legal perspective, like I have had people approach with, oh, I want to do a real estate fund, but I want to invest half of it in real estate and the other half in crypto, for example. Yeah. And legally, we can do that and we can make all the disclosures, but the risk profiles of those two are completely different. So from, from a passive investor standpoint, that, that probably doesn't make any sense. But I do have clients that have a, a really big following and they have a lot of people that know, like, and trust them already. And they have extremely broad fund criteria to the point where it may just be, for example, I'll give a, a client, I'm not going to give a name, but they are in in the mobile home park industry and their fund criteria is essentially we are buying mobile home parts in the united states <laughs> period full stop but they have so much credibility and they have the team and they have the expertise that people trust them and that's why that trust factor is so important so again as a passive investor do your due diligence find out as much as you can about the sponsor and their experience of their team and their systems and their knowledge and all that stuff because that really is what's going to mitigate some of the potential issues in a blind fund okay so that was from an investor's perspective now let's talk about the operator, the, the fund manager's perspective. You just mentioned it's probably the most important thing is, well, in, in most investments, if you want a great deal, you've got to be able to close quickly with cash. And oftentimes it might be 20, 30, 40 million dollars you need ready. And that's hard to raise overnight and as quickly as it needs to be done. So from a fund manager perspective, having that money ready oh my gosh. is so helpful. It is. And so if everybody could do a fund, it would be a nice thing to do because having, like you said, 40 million dollars the bank gives you a competitive advantage on over other buyers. Like you said, you can either buy something in cash, for example, and get, get that discount or get to the front of the line. Or maybe even you can show the seller, then you don't have to go raise the money. Maybe your other, usually competitors have to go raise capital, which puts a little bit of a risk for the seller. So if you can come in and say, look, I've already got the cash. I can close in seven days or 14 days. I obviously want to do some due diligence, but I don't have to rely on raising capital. It's already in my bank account. You know, here it is. It gives you a huge competitive advantage. The challenge is, is simply that it is harder to raise money with a blind fund because, again, people don't know what you're buying. And so they, you really have to have that credibility with your passive investors for them to just blindly write you a $100,000 check or a $50,000 check and trust you with their money without really knowing what you're going to go buy other than that fund criteria. Well, another problem that you might run into is now you've raised $40 million, but you can't find the asset. I imagine that happened a lot last year when there was multiple offers and it was difficult. Maybe maybe it'll be easier in the coming months, but... We have talked about this, but you're kind of reading my mind here because that's <laughs> that was going to be my second point I was going to raise is, uh, you know, what happens when you raise all the money and, you know, maybe it takes you six months to find the proper. So you have to address that as a syndicator. And that's one of the main discussion points we have with our clients. And what we generally recommend, it's not the only way to do it, but some people want to just collect commitments, for example, soft commitments and the stuff. But that's not a good idea because people change their mind and other circumstances happen. So what we recommend is actually making the pass investor put down a deposit. So go through the whole exercise of doing all the all the disclosure documents, the PPM, and let's say they've committed to invest, you know, fifty thousand dollars into your fund. Have them deposit five thousand dollars up front as their deposit, and then when you actually find the property, then you could do a sort of a cash call for the remaining forty-five. And if for some reason the past investor changes their minds and wants to do it, they would forfeit that 10%. So it really dissuades them from, you know, six months later saying, well, I found another, the shiny petty syndrome, right? I found another deal. I don't want to do yours because they've already got 10%. And some people do 20. It's whatever you feel is enough to lock in that investor because they really have been locked in. They're signing all the subscription agreements and the, they're, they're committing from a legal perspective, but you don't collect all the money so that it's not just sitting in your bank account for six months while you go, you know, find properties. Do you have a hard time finding them? Then it's just sitting in an account with you know earning no interest and your investors probably not going to like that so once they have signed the ppm and the operating agreement and put in a portion of the funds 
they are legally committed. Yep, they're gonna. You're gonna go to the exact same match. So the only difference is instead of them wiring you fifty thousand for the entire subscription, they're gonna wire you ten percent or fifteen percent or twenty percent. And then when you need the money, you're gonna give them whatever we disclose seven days, five days, whatever it is they need for them to get you that uh, uh, re remaining ninety percent. And if they don't, there's some severe consequences, which is basically forfeit that deposit. Wait, something I get confused about, and I think a lot of people also get confused about, is the fund to fund model, raising a fund to invest in another fund. How do you do that legally? <laughs> that's a two hour, that's a two hour video, uh, Kathy. Uh, the next thing. Now, that was, let me give you the, 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 the really thing that I think most people miss. And it's a very subtle, but it's so critical. When you're doing a blind fund, you are raising money and you're investing in real estate. You don't need a special, you don't need a real estate license. You don't need anything special to do that. Yeah. But when you invest in somebody else's deal, you're no longer buying real estate you're buying shares in that their company, or in this case, membership units in that LLC. So you become a limited partner in their deal. So it's like buying Apple stock or some other company. So you're in the business of buying securities. Yes. And that opens up a whole new can of worms that other, in addition to all the SEC stuff we usually talk about, 506B, 506C, all that kind of stuff, you now have to worry about, you know, you become a registered, you become an investment advisor, for example, the, the law of recognize because you're advising your fund as to the purchase of securities. So now you're an investment advisor. So then the question becomes, do I need to register somewhere as an investment advisor? You also have the issue of you're sort of a passive company. So now you may become an investment company, which will trigger the Investment Companies Act of 1940, which you don't want to, we want no part of that. And then there's broker dealer issues. I mean, you're, you just open up another can of worms. So it can be done and we do a lot of them, but it, it really is the level of compliance and complexity increases when you do a fund of funds. But people seem to be doing them all the time. They do because there's a lot of people out there which have the ability to go raise the capital, but don't really want to be either they're not good operators or they don't want to deal with the operations. They're just going to raise the capital. And because you can't get compensated to raise capital without a broker deal license, which you're not going to go get, this is one way that you can add value to your investors by putting together a fund yourself, going through all the compliance yourself, and then doing the due diligence on behalf of the investors, negotiating better terms for your investors, going down and flying to the property and doing all that stuff, maybe even having access to an investment that you otherwise wouldn't be because maybe the investment has a $250,000 minimum and so they don't want to pay that, but your fund may be only $50,000 minimum so they can get into the investment. So there's a lot of value you can add, then get compensated for adding value to investors versus just getting compensated to raise capital, which you can't. Woo! Okay, again, we'll do a whole other video on the fund of fund model, but um, in any case, if you're going to be using investor funds and especially passive, make sure you talk to a good attorney. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you Thanks, Kathy. for your free legal advice. I'm Kathy Fetke. We'll see you next time here on Bigger Pockets on the Market, presented by Fundrise.